today's topic is very important. Uh, Meta-analysis has become a very important tool for us. It goes beyond a qualitative uh, review of literature and provides, I think, more definitive uh, answers in terms of assessing uh, past research and, and also enabling us to look forward for future research ideas. So meta-analysis is, uh, is a great tool. It's not as complicated. And we have somebody who's gonna tell us a little bit about, at least provide an overview of meta-analysis, someone who's very qualified to speak on this topic has uh, used meta-analysis for various uh, research papers and, and you'll have access to his uh, papers as well. Not only this presentation, but also Ahmed will share with us uh, a series of resources, papers, journal articles, which will be helpful to us for those of us who would like to dig deeper into meta-analysis. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background about Ahmed, I think many of you in IB uh, are familiar, probably met him at the annual AIB conferences. Uh, Ahmed Kurja uh, is a professor at Michigan State University. Uh, he received his degree from the University of South Carolina IB program. And Ahmed, I think you taught at George Washington University for four years, five years before you moved on to Michigan State where you serve as the doctoral program director and also director of the cyber and international business center there. Uh, you're very active in mentoring doctoral students, very active in professional societies like AIB and also of course teaching and, and research. So Ahmed, we're very pleased to have you here. Uh, looking forward to uh, learning uh, a little bit about the tool uh, and, and some directions for further learning, which we will get from you. So with that, I'll turn, turn over to you. We'll have about 10, 15 minutes at the end to respond to some general questions, and then uh, we'll take it from there. But welcome everybody today for joining us. And uh, Ahmed, Professor Kurja, thank you for being here, sharing your expertise with us. Well, thank you very much for this great opportunity uh, and for organizing the webinar. Um, I think um, GSU's webinars are really a very interesting, very important contribution to the way we started to do uh, what we're doing, especially in the past three months. And this is very innovative, very interesting. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much. So, uh, well, Tamaroja has done a great job. Um, so I'm not really going to go and spend a lot of time uh, about my introduction, but basically, um, well, I'm an IB marketing guy who graduated from South Carolina. I worked at George Washington University. I've been at Michigan State for a while now, since 2006, and currently I'm serving as the PhD program director in marketing as well as the IBC cyber director. I've been teaching international business marketing and marketing strategy, and I've been doing research on firm strategic orientations, firm internationalization, and innovation topics. And meta-analysis is something uh, that I'm really passionate about. I'm interested as a methodology and to investigate some of those research questions uh, that I came across, uh, I used meta-analytic research methods. So I will, today I'll talk about uh, meta-analysis, what's a meta-analysis, and why do we need more meta-analysis in international business and how we can use meta-analysis as a method to investigate some interesting research questions. And I'll briefly go over the stages of the meta-analytic research process. And then I have a few recommendations, mostly some websites or books or uh, articles that covered this issue rather extensively. So meta-analysis is a systematic and quantitative review technique that, help, uh, that helps a field to take stock of knowledge by combining uh, findings across studies, so aggregating findings across studies, comparing these study findings, 
and generating and testing theoretical propositions. Uh, the logic of meta-analysis is basically uh, relates to, it, I mean, is, is related to the comparison between a systematic and narrative review. In a meta-analysis, we do a systematic review uh, in the sense that we have very clear selection criteria about the articles that we include and exclude. Uh, and we go through a quantitative process that allows us to synthesize all relevant studies in that domain that we identified uh, addressing a particular research question. Uh, in that sense, meta-analysis is very useful in identifying the direction and magnitude of the effects across studies, unlike the narrative reviews that tend to be a little bit more biased in terms of the selection criteria that they are using, and of course, a lot more qualitative in nature. So in a meta-analysis, basically, we are finding, we are aggregating the statistical findings of studies that focus on a particular relationship. Think of it as A affects B. So across studies, we're trying to figure out what's the main effect, the uh, overall main effect of that variable of A on B. So why is that important in international business? Well, it's an excellent tool for international business because that allows us to provide empirical generalizations about phenomena across different research contexts. And in particular, for international business, that's very critical because collecting data across countries, across uh, contexts, is a lot more uh, costly in international business research. So meta-analysis, in fact, sees each country context as a domain from which you sample studies. So, I mean, in general, meta-analysis is useful because it allows us to aggregate findings of studies across different uh, contexts, but in particular in international business, it's an excellent tool because it allows us to provide empirical generalizations about phenomena across different research contexts. Uh, and when we aggregate the findings of studies across different studies, we can also examine the effects of substantive and methodological study characteristics that might not necessarily be available if you're just focusing on a single study. Because uh, in a meta-analysis, we're aggregating the findings across studies, and we're not only looking at the main effects, which are related to the substantive issues of interests, but also to methodological study characteristics. We code the study characteristics and we can also assess the extent to which those study characteristics act as moderators of those relationships that we are interested in. And the third version or the third type of meta-analysis that you can see, so in fact, actually, I'm just going to eventually tell that these are three different types of meta-analysis you can find in the literature, main effect meta-analysis, moderator meta-analysis, and then uh, theory testing meta-analysis. And uh, in management, in marketing, as well as in psychology. Uh, this, the, the third approach is very common, and that involves testing theory using, a com using more comprehensive, mo comprehensive models of factors than those that have been employed in primary studies using aggregated correlation matrices. So uh, that's the third type of meta-analysis. So I'm not really going to go into the second and third bullet points in great detail, but I just wanted to point out here that meta-analyses are also very useful in teaching. Because at the end of the day, meta-analysis, meta-analytic studies allows you to say A affects B. And that's very useful in teaching. I mean, I use examples of meta-analyses uh, when I'm teaching in class. I'm from MBA, uh, from undergraduate all the way to doctoral students, obviously. And it's relevant for practitioners, and in fact, a field that uses meta-analyses very uh, frequently is 
uh, medicine. So practitioners in the medical field use meta-analytic findings to guide practice. So meta-analysis, in short, is useful uh, for research, for practice, as well as for teaching. So uh, in IB research, the number of meta-analyses have been relatively lower uh, than in the past. This is a paper that uh, we have worked on with Attila Yaprak, that I've, whose name uh, is also in our list of attendees. And it was a very interesting experience. What we did was we just looked at, across uh, studies that have been published in IB journals, management journals, and marketing journals with Professor Yaprak. And we have, ident uh, we have identified these trends that you can see up until 2010. And as you can see in management journals, uh, meta-analysis is a very, very common practice. In IB journals, on the other hand, the number is really lagging. So uh, although after 2009 and 10, I think those numbers went up a little bit more, a little higher, I would argue that management and marketing journals have also published a higher number of uh, meta-analyses in the past. So uh, this is just a very brief introduction to meta-analysis, uh, meta why it's important, why we need to do more meta-analyses in IB research. Uh, now I'm just going to focus on the meta-analytic research process. We have five steps, five stages in the meta-analytic research process from problem formulation all the way to interpretation and discussion of results. And I have, to men I have to tell you that uh, I'm not going to be able to cover everything in great detail. Sometimes I do workshops for five days workshops on this or uh, at AIB, there's another workshop. I think it's going to be two, three hours. If you can sign up for that, um, that might give you some more details about the stages in the meta-analytic research process. But uh, there are a lot of references at the end of my presentation here that covers all these uh, steps in much greater detail. So I'll just uh, briefly cover those stages in the next uh, 10 minutes or so. So the very first stage is the problem formulation. And I always get this question, when can you do a meta-analysis? Uh, well, meta-analysis is applicable. And there's no magic number for meta-analysis. That's the first answer I get. There's really, you can do a meta-analysis with 20 studies and you can do a meta-analysis for 200 studies. So basically, uh, there's really no magic number for a meta-analysis. It's applicable uh, when, in a given research domain, studies produce quantitative results. So that's probably one of the most important uh, requirements of meta-analysis. If you don't have quantitative results, if you do not have some mean differences or correlations that you can code, uh, that you can use, uh, then you can't do a meta-analysis. If you have qualitative findings, well, that's a narrative review. Uh, the research domain should examine the same or similar constructs or relationships. So sometimes uh, the domain is very vaguely defined. I mean, I'm just using relationship marketing as one of the examples, although there are meta-analyses on that topic as well. But the relationship marketing for me is a very broad domain. It's hard to do a meta-analysis on a topic like relationship marketing and its effects and antecedents and consequences on uh, some, uh, some variables. Um, so uh, antecedents and consequences of relationship marketing. Uh, the findings should be configured in a comparable statistical form. So the, we call them effect sizes. Uh, the simplest way of looking at it is differences, proportions, odds ratios, or the most straightforward one are correlation coefficients uh, or elasticities. So those are all different measures of effect sizes and they should be comparable. And that's one of the biggest problems sometimes people uh, have to deal with when they are doing meta-analysis. If you do not have those comparable uh, statistical uh, uh, ratios or effect sizes, basically, then adding, I mean, even if the topic, uh, if, if the domain uses similar constructs and um, research produces quantitative results, 
it's really hard to aggregate findings across studies. This basically means that uh, you shouldn't mix apples and oranges on the statistical side. Don't mix, for example, regression coefficients with uh, correlation coefficients because they're not one and the same thing. We can't aggregate those findings. Um, and one interesting aspect, um, w w something that would signal that it might be a good idea to do a meta-analysis is those disparate findings in the literature. So if you have uh, similar constructs uh, and relationships, and yet researchers find uh, that A affects B this way in context A, and then A affects B that way in context B, and if you have enough studies, then it might really uh, be a good idea to look at that topic uh, using a meta-analysis. So here's an example that we worked on uh, with uh, Professor Chabushkil and several others, um, and we published at AMJ in 2011. So the topic was multinationality and performance. That's one of the most frequently studied relationships in the international business literature. And uh, we thought, well, you know, hey, you know, do you have quantitative findings, the same relationship, that's an important topic. And a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, conflicting findings. So multinationality is about the extent to, extent to which a firm expands its valuating activities beyond national borders into new country markets uh, and geographic re uh, regions. So that's degree of internationalization, multinationality, international diversification. So that's one thing that I would uh, uh, attract or just kind of focus here. Um, and that's about the, the way in which the same construct is captured in different ways under different names in different domains, just like here. So international diversification, multinationality, or degree of internationalization, those are terms that refer basically to the same concept that you see here. But uh, these are the names in different fields, IB, uh, management, um, and marketing. So uh, it's a well-established research stream in IB and in, ma in management in particular. Um, and uh, several studies have been published uh, that investigate the linear, nonlinear effects of multinationality on in service industries for U.S. and non-U.S. companies, as well as for small and large firms. And as I said, there are a lot of mixed findings, inconclusive, inconsistent, contradictory, conflicting, disappointing findings. Uh, and these are just references from various studies that uh, Label the IB, the MP, the multinationality performance relationship uh, in prior research. So inconclusive findings were there. That's actually one of the reasons we thought it might be a good idea to look at this topic. So the biggest recommendation I would have for the problem formulation state is to read, read, and read more because uh, you have to define the construct properly and then you have to make sure that the same construct is covered, I mean, uh, you have to make sure that you cover different fields, domains, uh, and disciplines sometimes that investigate similar or the same relationship um, in different disciplines. And of course, uh, you have to identify that key contribution that your paper would have because aggregation of prior research uh, is always coming with some, uh, is, always comes with some drawbacks. People always ask you, okay, so what's new about this? I mean, people have been looking at multinationality performance relationship uh, for decades, and what's your theoretical contribution? And that's a big hurdle in the review process. That's why you have to make sure that you also have a theoretical contribution to this domain, not just aggregating findings, empirical findings across studies. So in that study, uh, these are the steps that we performed uh, to do the literature search and data collection. So we looked at multinationality, degree of internationalization, and so on. We looked at, uh, we did an issue by issue search 
for major management and IB journals, examine references of other reviews, uh, search the websites of uh, places where we can find working papers, and then we'll put requests, uh, posted requests on AIB and AOM list servers to uh, elicit unpublished research in an effort to address the file drawer problem. So those are all specific steps that you need to perform for the literature search and data collection. And of course, um, well, there are a lot of minor steps that I'm just skipping here uh, as we do not have enough time to cover them all, but uh, there are references at the end and sources that might help you identify those additional ones if necessary. So my recommendation here is search, search, and search far and wide. So as I said before, um, there might be sub-disciplines that name, that give the same, uh, different labels to the same relationship. There might be the same relationship in neighboring disciplines. Uh, so you have to make sure that uh, you do your search properly. So the idea here is to have a representative sample of studies that investigated this particular topic, published and unpublished studies. So coding is painful. That's not really the most exciting part of doing a meta-analysis, I have to admit that. You have, and, and that's very important because you can code as you wish and then you'll find whatever you wanna find. And that's not how we do research, right? So uh, you need to first uh, prepare a coding protocol uh, specifying the information to be extracted. Nowadays, journals are actually asking you to submit this coding pro protocol along with the studies that you used uh, in an Excel sheet. So I'm really happy to see that because I've always been very careful uh, with these types of issues and uh, went the extra mile to be able to evaluate, uh, to do a good job with the evaluation and coding. And uh, those documents have always been ready for, my, for the meta-analyses I have worked on. So uh, the coding form is prepared based on that protocol and uh, coders use that coding form to record uh, data, basically, uh, on the variables of interest, outcome statistics, so correlation coefficients or differences uh, or elasticities, sample sizes, as well as statistical artifacts, such as reliability statistics, et cetera. And then the study characteristics. So that's really where the value of a meta-analysis comes into play because uh, if you code uh, your studies adequately, identify those interesting study characteristics, then that's where the potential contribution comes from. Uh, it's always a good idea to have multiple coders and compare the coders using some sort of inter-reliability estimates. And the discrepancies need to be resolved through discussion uh, when you have those independent coders. Uh, if you have a single coder, that's always a red flag for reviewers because it just gives the impression that, well, you know, I just coded those studies and I found these findings, but are they replicable? That's always the question, especially in a meta-analytic context that uh, replication is really the golden standard. So code, code, read, and recode. So coding seems to be pretty straightforward, but reading through this process while you're coding is also very important because of those study characteristics that might allow you to identify some interesting theoretical, uh, theoretically interesting vari uh, variables that would be useful for your meta-analysis. That's why you need to read while your coding as well, because as you go, as you code, you might identify some study characteristics, contextual variables that would be useful for your purposes. And then you have to go back and see how that fits in the grand scheme of things in that domain. So data analysis is another area, but unlike the coding and evaluation of original studies, 
I like this part a lot more because there are lots of interesting ways of looking at data. First, you have correlation coefficients, but you can use elasticities, you can use differences, you can use proportions. So there are lots of different uh, effect size estimates that you can use. Uh, here in this paper, we had the correlation coefficients for the multinationality performance relationship. We corrected them uh, for reliability. So those are some of the steps that we had to go, and those are all detailed in that AMJ 2011 paper. Uh, the homogeneity of effects need to be tested, and there are actually a lot more recent approaches uh, that allows you to, to, to give you, this is like a chi-square test, the homogeneity of effects. Actually, there are much more precise ways of looking at uh, how you can test the homogeneity now. now. Uh, published in some other journals, and uh, they really provide interesting uh, ways of looking at data. So, analyzing, uh, recoding, reading, and reanalyzing, that's really key here uh, because uh, you might really identify interesting variables, and then uh, you can go back and recode uh, for those variables and then analyze again. Uh, so there's, there's an iterative process here as well. Uh, so you have to go back to the literature to figure out how to recode those because, well, uh, just like with primary data, it's not always uh, what you find. I mean, you cannot always get all the results that you're hoping to find and that you might need to go back and recode sometimes. So the next one is uh, summarizing and interpreting the results. Uh, so these are some basic recommendations. You need to have summary tables for main effects, moderator analysis, and structural models. If you're testing theory, the third one. Uh, here is an example for the main effects table from the AMJ paper. Uh, main effects for multinationality performance relationship. So here, this is the outcome basically of uh, what uh, of a meta-analysis. So here we're looking at R&D intensity, the effects of R&D intensity and advertising intensity. So those are the uh, variables that have been used to measure asset specificity in the multinationality literature or international diversification literature. So here, this this uh, uh, this column uh, gives you an idea about how many effect sizes we obtained from original studies, uh, the total sample size number of firms for those 84 effect sizes. And if I'm not mistaken, we use one effect size per study in this study, uh, so in this meta-analysis. And we calculated this corrected uh, mean or mean R. So that's the aggregation of results part. 0.14 is the average effect of asset specificity uh, or R&D intensity and advertising intensity on uh, multinationality. These are the drivers of multinationality, according to Buckley and Kasson's paper. Uh, and um, then you calculate the standard error around this corrected mean, and then you calculate the confidence interval. And the last column is availability bias, captures the availability bias, and it tells you how many studies with null results you need to uh, nullify the effect that you see here, 0.14. So for the consequences of multinationality performance outcomes, we have all these variables, and that's really the nice part, interesting findings. You can, it's really hard to collect all of those from a single study, especially in 90s and 2000s when, when we didn't have those large databases. Um, but across studies, you can actually calculate the mean effects of multinationality on performance. So that's the main effects table. Uh, here you have a moderator analysis, bivariate moderator analysis table. So uh, for the MP, the multinationality performance relationship for, for firms that have high R&D intensity versus low R&D intensity. Um, and you have to provide evidence about 
uh, we have to uh, report the strength of the evidence with uh, correlation coefficients uh, and the effect size. Uh, that's really key there. And then trying to uh, address some of those uh, reviewer comments might be challenging. That's the point here. Still, meta-analysis is a developing field and especially the way it's applied in international business management and marketing uh, varies substantially, I would say. So expectations vary across different journals. So that's really something that we should probably be working on. Um, and, and you need to make sure that you also include the limitations. So I'm just going to move on here to some of the recommendations uh, to conclude my presentation to have enough time for questions. So these are the typical limitations of a meta-analysis. I'm not going to go over those, but this is what I would like to talk a little bit of, a little bit now. So one of the questions I get a lot is about which software I'm using. I actually don't use any softwares for the meta-analysis. I just use Excel sheets. That's really the easiest way for me. That's how I started. Uh, and that's how I continue. Of course, I use SAS or STATA uh, and uh, R uh, lately, but um, I don't use a meta-analysis meta software like the one provided here uh, in comprehensive meta-analysis. Coding is pretty straightforward. You just need an Excel sheet. There are some alternatives that I listed here, but R, STATA, SAS, and SPSS, uh, well, those are the softwares that you can use and there are some specific syntax uh, that you need to be familiar with when you're analyzing data. And these sources hopefully might guide you in your efforts to um, identify or find or get more familiar with those syntaxes and um, a lot more. So this website from Wilson, uh, Professor Wilson from George Mason University, it's very useful. Uh, there's an entire evidence-based med med medicine uh, website and movement, uh, evidence-based management movement as well, uh, in the last 10 years or so, uh, that you can just Google and find, but this is the Cochrane is really the gold standard. The Campbell collaboration will give you, will guide you uh, to other sources, and this is the evidence-based management website, sebma.org. And uh, Bornstein's website is also uh, pretty good. Uh, and he also has a book on uh, meta-analysis. And here are my favorites. So practical meta-analysis is an easy and quick uh, detailed though, exposure that gives you an easy, quick, but detailed exposure to meta-analysis. Lipsy and Wilson, and that's the Wilson that I recommended previously. Uh, from George Mason University. This second, I mean, the second edition of the Handbook of Research Synthesis and Meta-Analysis is an excellent book, but you need to be a little bit more familiar with the uh, meta-analytic process uh, because these are different chapters that deal with various issues all the way from data collection to data analysis. And uh, the uh, methods, the Schmidt, and Hunter is a classic. Uh, we have now, I think this is the latest edition, third edition. Um, and um, well, these are really the biggest names. Uh, that MSU is Michigan State University is proud of because uh, they've been Michigan State. These are psych, I mean, some people from the psych departments and they've made really significant contributions to this field. So if you wanna go the extra mile, this is what I would recommend. Uh, Schmidt and Hunter. But I would start with Lipsy and Wilson and then maybe move to this one and uh, get Schmidt and Hunter to go into the weeds of meta-analysis. Here are some additional readings for you. Bornstein is a pretty straightforward one. So if you find Lipsy and Wilson a little bit complicated, then go back to uh, Bornstein and Hedges and Higgins paper uh, book. And that's that starts from the bare bones, from very basic stuff. Uh, and then you can go and cover the material in Lipsy um, and Wilson. 
Uh, this is for public management and policy, even um, Rehnquist. Uh, it's very similar to Bornstein, but uh, basically the idea here is, yeah, you can use meta-analysis for public management and policy. That's another venue where meta-analysis can successfully be applied. And this is a generic book about meta-analysis, the story of meta, the history of meta-analysis by Hunt, Morton Hunt, uh, How Science Takes Stock. So these are just uh, a few suggestions, recommendations for you to uh, get more familiar, uh, well, a lot more familiar, because if you cover all of those books, I think it'd be in pretty good shape. So thank you very much, and questions. And thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. You did a great job in a limited uh, <laughs> period. That was <laughs> fast. It was a good overview. Good <laughs> overview. That, that. But uh, I'm, I'll just make a few comments and uh, you can also see the questions. There are some questions that are worth responding to. But you mentioned evidence-based management. That's definitely a trend in uh, corporate circles these days. Uh, companies uh, are not just relying upon intuition or assumptions to make decisions, investment decisions, for example. Senior management always wants uh, evidence. Uh, so evidence based on research, evidence based on artificial intelligence. They, this is one of the reasons why data analytics has become uh, a much more trendy as well. So that's very important. Going back to what you said earlier, uh, you know, taking stock, I think it's a great way to take stock, to take inventory of what's been done and produce generalizable results. And you talked about that too. So meta-analysis really puts you in a powerful position to be able to say, you know, here's the relationship at the end of the day between A and B. So you have a certain degree of robustness uh, and generalizability and reliability associated with this quantitative uh, method. Uh, and so there are some questions, for example, Sarah asks, uh, are there certain databases that lend themselves to meta-analysis better? Uh, you may want to comment on that, but what I will say is that what I, from what I have seen, and Ahmed, you can uh, tell me whether this is correct. My observation is that meta-analysis becomes even more useful for comparing the results of primary research, where you have a large number of uh, researchers, you know, large number of papers digging into the same topic, but they are contradictory, inconclusive, uh, and you would like to have one summative, one generalizable answer. So then you ask yourself, okay, what is the fundamental relationship between A and B? Uh, remembering that most of our knowledge in international business and social sciences in general is contingent uh, on certain factors, right? Certain, certain samples, certain times, certain variables, certain measurements, measurements that researchers have used. So to be able to conclude and say that, well, across all of these uh, studies, here's what we find. Here's something we can conclude. So that makes meta-analysis very effective when you have contradictory findings from a number of uh, pieces of research where, where uh, the data is primary data. Although there's no reason why you cannot use secondary data as well. What do you think on that, Ahmed? Well, as you said, the unit of analysis in a meta-analysis is individual primary studies. So if the database question is related to the search engines or library uh, sources where you can search those articles, then my answer would be, well, that depends on research topics. Basically, if you're looking at psychology, then there are, I mean, on a topic that where you can find, I mean, we did a meta-analysis recently, it's on the review now, it's about, uh, motivation basically i was asked to join to help them uh, with that meta-analysis and it's about extrinsic versus intrinsic motivation uh, the search engines that we looked for that purpose was 
were different than the ones I would typically use in strategy research. Uh, but I mean, uh, you're right. I mean, basically, this is not about databases and searching across uh, variables like the ones that you would find in CompuStat or some other uh, uh, databases where you have primary data. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, you can okay. use EBSCO, yeah. you can use, but definitely yeah. Google Scholar is really not my favorite. You have to use one of those uh, that are related to the citation counts that are available through university websites, not, not Google Scholar. I mean, people usually look down at Google Scholar because there are a lot of issues with Google Scholar uh, articles. You can't just use keywords in Google Scholar and say, okay, we found 10,000 articles and we analyze those. Uh, so I'd rather go with those databases or search engines that are available through universities. Yeah, you talked about uh, coding and you mentioned that you simply use Excel. One of our colleagues is asking, you know, do, uh, what, what do you use? Uh, you kind of answered that. But uh, is there, are there really alternatives to that? Because what you're coding is really what you're getting from these various empirical studies. So whatever the effect size, you're measuring correlation coefficient, uh, beta measures, whatever. Uh, so uh, you don't have to make it comp more complicated than that, right? I mean, uh, Excel, Excel capturing the, the data in the Excel uh, is sufficient, right? Well, I mean, this comprehensive meta-analysis allows you to code and then analyze the data, but I've never used any one of those meta-analysis softwares myself. The way I did was I coded data uh, using multiple coders uh, in Excel. So enter data in different formats, and that just depends on the meta-analysis. There's no one perfect way of doing uh, meta-analysis. I mean, that depends on the study context, what kind of variables you're going to code depends on the context of the study and the relationship that you are looking at Therefore, there's really not one coding form or one right way of doing meta-analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, my suggestion would be to go across different meta-analyses and look at what people are coding. Make sure that you include those study characteristics uh, in your coding form and also uh, look at the context, uh, your research question and identify some unique variables for that context. Mm -hmm. uh, but these softwares, uh, can be used to capture, to code, and then you can directly analyze data, at least calculate the mean effects and run some moderator analysis and so on. But uh, if you want to go to the structural equation uh, modeling approach and more advanced Bayesian approaches uh, that are available now, actually, uh, then uh, you, you can't, I don't think any of those softwares would be useful. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, you, tried, you so. may have, uh, Ahmed, you may have touched on this earlier, but a colleague asks how many papers ideally should be available to proceed with meta-analysis. Uh, I, I guess in general, the more the better, uh, but is there a minimum size that uh, reviewers would like to see? Minimum size of empirical papers from which you gathered your uh, main effects data? There's really no magic number, but I, for a meta-analysis, if, I mean, if you're gonna publish it as a meta-analysis, because there are nowadays in JCR and in, psych, in psychology journals, small meta-analyses people do as part of their introduction. So that's really cool too. So they just kind of look at, okay, I mean, instead of those tables where uh, we provide uh, how uh, our research contributes to that, to a particular domain that we are asked to do as part of the review process, especially in the last 10 years or so, more frequently than ever, right? Table one, just identify your literature review with checks, you know, Paul Matthias style. So basically, uh, 
now JCR is actually asking, uh, not asking, but for some JCR submissions, uh, people are working on small meta-analyses, like with 10 studies, 15 studies. Uh, they just do the literature review, but do a systematic literature review with keywords and everything. And then they show that the mean effect for the relationship that they're looking at is this, and then their findings is that. So I think that's really a very nice way of strengthening the quality of the paper, especially uh, the literature review section of the paper. Uh, so meta-analysis can be published as a separate paper or can definitely be part of a bigger project uh, like we see in consumer behavior research. So, I mean, you can do a meta-analysis with 20 studies, 15 studies. Can you publish it? That's a different story. Uh, so there's really no magic number there. But if you have a, over 100 studies, that's when you can really run your regression, moderated regression analysis, because one of the biggest problems that you encounter when, you, when you're doing a meta-analysis is missing data. Not everybody reports the same thing across studies. So there's a lot of missing data when you're coding. And uh, with 100 studies, uh, it's really hard to find uh, studies that focused on the same type of relationships with the same study characteristics. That's why uh, having a high number of studies help uh, with power, with your regression and, analysis. And, and I, I suppose you don't always get collaboration or cooperation from authors. Not really. Uh, when you ask them about their correlation coefficients, if they've not published it as part of the paper, or additional information. So some people will not respond uh, and therefore you need to contend with a smaller sample. That's correct. Yeah, here's an interesting uh, question. I'd like you to comment on this, Ahmed. Uh, how can we make the uh, interpretation of, of a meta-analysis more novel by, let's say, adding things from your own experiences, from, let's say, management literature, you know, trends and so on. So a paper, I think this colleague is conceiving a paper where you're reporting, okay, the results of your meta-analysis, but then you're making it a bit more, you know, more interesting and more novel by combining it with your uh, subjective insights or insights from management practice. Uh, I suppose in general that would make it more interesting, more novel. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that, but what would you say about that, that, that comment, that question? Well, I mean, certainly uh, managerial relevance of studies is uh, important and meta-analysis can help uh, with managerial practice, just like we talked briefly about, you know, evidence-based management. Uh, so that would be something I would probably include in the discussion section. Uh, and I think that would add value, definitely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, here's a question, Ahmed. Uh, some studies, this colleague says, operationalize the dependent variable with several measures. Uh, operationalize the dependent variable with several measures. Uh, is it advisable to take the average of the correlation coefficients to include all the correlation coefficients? And, and that doesn't make sense to me, does it uh, to you? Yeah, uh, well, I think the issue is uh, the level of aggregation. So what are you trying to generalize to? You don't really want to generalize to a very high level. So let's say you're looking at financial performance, right? That's a dependent variable. So return on assets, return on sales, this and that. You can count 10 different, like in, the, uh, in our meta-analysis, multinationality meta-analysis, I just showed you a table where we have uh, seven, eight uh, measures of financial performance, right? So, I mean, you can generalize multinationality performance, financial performance, by aggregating all of those effect sizes, because financial performance is a meaningful dependent variable. But if you just say performance, take it to the next level and put 
social performance, customer satisfaction, customer performance, and then stock market performance, and then all these financial performance measures, then multinationality performance relationship becomes really vague. I mean, the level of aggregation is way too high, and I would uh, avoid doing that. That wouldn't make sense. But financial performance, uh, that, that makes more sense, but you can break it down in the study uh, in a way that would allow, tease out the individual effects of each one of those different measures of financial performance as well, and that would add value to the study, to the meta-analysis. Mm -hmm. A colleague asks, uh, can you please speak uh, more to the third type of meta-analysis that you described, the uh, theoretical meta-analysis? Well, that is probably the most time-consuming one uh, to prepare the data for. So for the theoretical, uh, I mean, basically the third type of meta-analysis uh, prepares tests, predictions, of um, a structural model, A affects B, then affects C. So in this meta-analysis, I mean, in our multinationality, in our multinationality meta-analysis, we did that. Uh, we looked at the drivers of multinationality and looked at multinationality. So those firm-specific assets were the drivers of multinationality, and we, we put other strategic variables and demonstrated that multinationality uh, has value above and beyond R&D intensity and advertising intensity and so on and so forth. So firm-specific assets uh, have independent effects on performance, but multinationality still has value. In another paper uh, published in the Journal of Marketing, we looked at, for example, market orientation and how market orientation affects uh, customer outcomes, innovation outcomes, and employee outcomes, which then lead to financial performance. So that mediation effect that we teased out using meta-analysis was the main contribution of, one of the main contributions of that meta-analysis. So that's what I mean by the theoretical meta-analysis, uh, testing theory or using meta-analysis for theory testing purposes. Mm -hmm. Maybe we have time for one more uh, quick question. Uh, this colleague asks, can we incorporate hypothesis into the papers uh, where we have done a meta-analysis and uh, uh, we can formalize our findings uh, through hypothesis? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, you can use that for the first, second, or the third type of meta-analysis I've, uh, I've described. For the, for the first type, I think the hypothesis would not be very interesting because you are already picking a particular relationship that has been investigated extensively in the literature. So there, the theoretical contribution of that hypothesis would be limited. But the second type of hypothesis where you investigate the effects of moderators, contextual moderators or study characteristics on that main effect, uh, you would need hypotheses for that, for those. And certainly for the third type, you definitely need hypotheses because you are testing a new theoretical model using meta-analysis. Excellent, excellent. There's a lot more questions, but we'll share some of these with you and uh, with, with colleagues as well. So I will, given the time, we always try to stick to one hour for these webinars, respecting people's time. But again, uh, we appreciate everybody's participation. We have over 100 people uh, today with us. And Hannah, you have the last word. Yes. Thank you, Amit, for sharing this great information with us thank today. You. And thank you everyone for joining us and sharing all of your fantastic questions.